Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Field Trip Health's next webinar, Breakthroughs in Therapy with Psychedelics. I'm joined by Dr. Kate Kalstein and Dr. Mark Short, two of our, uh, our clinical directors and, and director of trainings here at Field Trip Health, and they're here to deliver a informational session about the breakthroughs in therapy with psychedelics. So without further ado, take it away. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. I'm looking forward to, to meeting you on a more personal level um, at the end of this when we can do some more conversational stuff with question and answers. Um, but in the meantime, we have a presentation just to give you guys an introduction to what we do here at Field Trip, um, and then also a little bit of context into the field of psychedelic therapy in general, um, where it's come from and how it's been emerging. Uh, so um, my name is Mark Short. Um, I'm a naturopathic doctor by training. Um, I've spent the last few years working at a, um, an integrative psychiatry clinic in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley called Helios, um, where I was doing one-to-one um, -one, uh, ketamine-assisted therapy sessions with patients, um, as well as leading groups and trainings during that time. Um, and then I connected with Field Trip, and my role here is essentially to train um, all of the clinics that we're opening, so train our staff how to do psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, um, as well as um, doing outreach like this, so kind of getting involved with the therapeutic community and building connections and relationships and just kind of entering into this discussion of how we can all um, best work together and support each other, essentially. Dr. Hi, Caitlin. everyone. Yeah, I'm Dr. Caitlin Kelstein. I'm also a naturopathic physician. Um, I trained with Mark at the Ketamine Training Institute with Dr. Phil Wolfson and Dr. Jen Dore um, in 2018. And I've been in private practice doing ketamine therapy um, before I found Field Trip. And now I'm the clinical director of the Los Angeles Clinic. And today I'm going to take you through a bit about our program in LA and walk you through the clinic. Okay, so this is what we're talking about today. Um, the first question that I really like to start with in these kind of talks is why, why even consider um, adding psychedelics to therapy? Um, so we'll talk about that. And once we establish that, we'll go over a little bit of um, how ketamine was used and why it was used and how it's used now and how we see it being used in the future. We're going to talk about our model. And then uh, we're also going to speak to uh, your role as the therapist in all of this and what you want for your clients. And, you know, what, what does it mean to have this so-called breakthrough in therapy? What do you do with it? And when even is it kind of something to consider? So we'll go through all of those and just as well as kind of finishing off with how um, the ways that I see us being able to work together. I'd love to hear from you guys how you see us uh, working together. Again, we're all, we're all fairly new in this field. It's a fairly new field as it exists just in our current part in North America. Um, not that the techniques are, are that new. We'll talk about that as well. Um, but we'll just, I'd love to hear from you guys. What do you want out of possibly working with us, what would you want from us, and how would you want to be involved? So we'll get to all of that. Okay, so why why do this uh, in the first place? Um, I mean, I can, I can say just from my own experience, I've seen it be really effective, and we'll talk about why and what exactly that means. But first, I want to talk a little bit about how things are right now. So um, I'll just start by talking about the medical model. So at least in the medical world, there's this kind of standard paradigm. And again, not everyone has it. It's just kind of conventional. It's kind of what's been for the past little while. Um, but there are a lot of people who are open to new paradigms. But in general, what medicine has, or modern, conventional, you know, Western so-called medicine has tended to go towards is um, this model where there are symptoms and the goal of health or treatment is to reduce the symptoms. Right, you know, obviously we want to make sure there are no risks and underlying pathologies and things that would risk people's health. But the way that treatment is structured, especially from an insurance reimbursement model, is that here are the symptoms. This is what we think could be going on. These are the treatments. The symptoms are gone. 
um, because of this treatment that you did, whether it's you know taking these pills or getting a surgery or um, whatever it is that's pretty reductionist, but just kind of making the point um, that that's kind of a, a large paradigm of how medicine is operated in a standard way. Um, the reason that is important to bring up for this model is because in a way that's how ketamine therapy got started. Um, and we'll talk more about that history, but um, currently there are probably more ketamine therapy clinics that are associated on this model where you go in and it's the drug that is the therapeutic, right? So um, you have symptoms of depression. We know that there's research that shows that ketamine, given at this dose and these many sessions, et cetera, et cetera, can alleviate these symptoms of depression for this long. And um, so that's typically how it's used. You know, you go in, you sit in a comfortable chair, you get an IV in your arm for 45 or 50 minutes, maybe a, a medical assistant comes in and, and chats to you, or maybe they just turn on a TV screen. And then um, at the end of it, you kind of thank you for the treatment and come back next week or whenever it is. Um, and there's a reason, again, which we'll get to about why how that model started, but we see an opportunity here, right? As I think all of you do, and that's why you're here. Um, we see the opportunity for a more holistic approach, um, one that definitely involves the medical side of it. So I'm not denying, um, certainly not denying that ketamine just alone on its own as a drug can have these beneficial effects, right? At a very physiological level, and that's great. And we wanna leverage those. But to really make the most of this opportunity, we really want to work on a behavioral level. So that's where psychotherapy comes in and, and even a psycho-spiritual level. And I can talk more about what that means. It's not necessarily a religious paradigm. It's more that um, changes can happen in someone's consciousness. And why that's relevant is because that can actually have really big implications for their behavior, their mood, uh, their level of satisfaction with their life. All of these things, these, these measures or these these um, these aspects that we're interested in from a psychotherapeutic perspective as well. Essentially, we want to help people enjoy their lives more and have a better quality of life in addition to relieving these symptoms. And so our approach is that all of this is possible and psychedelic therapy, um, particular ketamine-assisted therapy, can help to do this and in some ways can can really uh, be a catalyst for all of those things happen. And then in terms of what this, so that's what we're doing right now. That's what we want, what we do to look like and, and what it does so far. And then we're also looking into the future of what could this look like? And so we call that the emerging models. And we really see the opportunity for this to be integrated into kind of a fully holistic whole person approach to health in general, right? So right now, medicine is really focused on alleviating symptoms, but it's starting to shift more towards wellness and lifestyle and preventative care, stopping these symptoms from happening in the first place. So it's really making sure that um, people are not just, oh, you know, make someone okay when they're unhealthy, but making sure that we keep ourselves and our society really healthy and we believe that mental health and fitness um, play an extremely large role in that um, and is as you guys know there's a lot of good research to to support that obviously um, and not only on the individual level but if we have time we can get to this on a social level um, just the idea that a lot of the illnesses and maladies that are in our society are occurring because of social conditions, you know, actual social structural things. And we call those the social determinants of health. So we're also looking forward to ways that psychedelics can be accessible and play a role in, okay, how could we have a more healthy society as a whole on a structural level? Is it possible for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy to play a role in that? So that's, you know, an ongoing conversation. It's a little bit more philosophical, but if we have the time, I'd really look forward to having that conversation with you guys. Okay, and again, just to kind of reiterate how this medicine differs. Um, and when we say this medicine, we're really talking about kind of our approach to it, right? Because it's not the thing you use or the pharmaceutical or whatever, that's the medicine, it's really the approach, um, you know, in our, in our belief and, and that's how we treat it. So we're looking to 
treat the cause, not the symptom, right? We're not trying to, we're not, um, it's not that we want, don't want people's anxiety to get better and their depression to go away, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, in a way that's necessary, but not sufficient. So what's actually underneath that? What's the start of that? How do we make sure that that doesn't remit and relapse and it goes away for a few months and then it's back? How do we make sure that these changes are positive and lasting as well? Another really important approach to our model is how do we empower the patient in this process? How do we get them to engage in the process of their own healing, of their own journey? So that's a really big uh, part for us. We feel it's really important to have the our, our clients participate in their own care in terms of envisioning what it, they want it to be and what they want to get out of that. And we'll talk more about how to do that in our kind of preparation and integration section. But that's a, a kind of a pillar of our approach. Um, again, it's collaborative, it's team care. Uh, we want to make sure that there's communication and collaboration between the our patient or client, as well as the therapist, as well as the doctors, uh, the guide in the psychedelic session, as well as anyone else in their care team. So that open line of communication and collaboration, again, is another pillar for us. And um, what we really want everyone to get out of this is uh, all the people who come through here is a deeper understanding of their, themselves, a deeper connection to themselves. Um, because the goal, once these symptoms are gone, is that they actually experience a deeper meaning in their life, more enjoyment, more fulfillment, and more purpose. Um, and the reason why I'm excited about this, and one of the reasons why I was really excited about joining this organization is because in, in the past few years of practicing, I have seen that happen. And um, there's definitely a way to, to do that and approach it that's that's actually quite reliable that people can experience that so for me that's one of the truly exciting things about this medicine and this approach okay thanks mark um so i'm going to talk just a moment about psychedelic medicine in general um, and I encourage you to go to the Field Trip YouTube channel. You can learn more about the history of psychedelics from our past webinars there. Um, as Mark alluded to, you know, this medicine is really about activating the internal, the inherent healing intelligence in each of us. And we use these medicines as a tool or as a catalyst for healing. Um, and this method is really nothing new. So I, I do think it's interesting to point out where the word psychedelic comes from and that's the ancient Greek word psyche, meaning soul or mind, and delaun, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, um, to show or reveal. So it's about revealing the soul. Um, it's also commonly translated differently as mind manifesting or soul manifesting. So across many different cultures and using different molecules, um, for example, the classic psychedelics like ayahuasca, psilocybin, peyote, um, one thing that's common is that they've been used with a sense of sacredness. So there has been this intention to create a container of a ritual or a ceremony around ingesting these compounds. And they're really considered to be a medicine for healing. Uh, and those that guide those rituals, those that guide those ceremonies are considered to be healers or shamans. Um, so what is the psychedelic experience like? So of course, there's a lot of variation depending on the compounds and the set and setting and the individual. Um, but there are some common experiences and some universal traits that we see come out of these experiences. And I've listed just a few here. Um, ego dissolution, so a sense of uh, a loss of sense of the small self and emerging into pure consciousness. Um, one can have a felt sense of an interconnectedness of all things inherently. Um, out of body experiences, near death experiences, uh, feeling of love and empathy and altruism, a sense of connection to something greater than oneself, and a sense overall that all is well. Of course, there can be difficulties that come up as well in these, um, but these are some of the more positive aspects that come out of journeys. Um, and another common report is that the experience itself somehow feels more real to the person who has been through it than waking reality. So. You know, if you look up psychedelic on Google or in the dictionary, it talks about a psychedelic being defined as something that produces hallucinations, which, you know, implies that it's not real. And people who take these medicines and participate in these ceremonies will actually tell you that it feels to them to be more real. 
um, are quite real. So there's also universal language around these rituals, which speaks to the participant taking a trip or a journey. Um, and the idea conveyed there is that one goes on this journey in order to obtain or to come in contact with some knowledge or to learn something that they can then bring back into their life. Um, they can bring this information or this knowing back into their uh, waking life. So certainly one of the benefits of, excuse me, make sure that goes back on, okay. Um, one of the beneficial things that we see with psychedelic medicine is just that, that it, it gives one the direct experience of their internal landscape in a way that is beyond intellectualizing. So in other words, uh, one experiences perhaps an emotional resonance that is often needed to catalyze change for them. So clients may have a very good intellectual understanding of what is contributing to their depression or anxiety. They may have a good idea of the behaviors that they, they should be engaging in to um, break out of their depression, but they're just unable to. And, and oftentimes that's because there's, there's lacking a felt sense or an emotional resonance around the issue. And psychedelics can help catalyze that. Um, and Mark is gonna speak in a moment to the specific types of experiences that um, one might have with ketamine specifically. So again, just to reiterate that, you know, man has been using mind altering substances for tens of thousands of years. So we, we have um, evidence dating back to prehistoric Africa um, of prehistoric humans consuming psilocybin fungi. Um, we also have, you know, the use of soma in Hindu rituals and uh, ergot fungus in ancient Greece. So we have quite an extensive history of experimenting with various compounds <clears throat> to change or enhance our level of consciousness. And then we fast forward to the 1900s where we started seeing synthesized molecules like MDMA and LSD. Um, and then they began to be used outside of religious context and outside of religious ceremony as a means of self-exploration throughout the 60s. And then of course that led to um, a movement where unfortunately many of these compounds that we were using for thousands of years in sacred ceremonies became illegal. So this map just highlights again the variety in medicines used across the world and, and this really nearly universal desire that humans have to partake in some sort of mind expanding ritual. And so let's talk a little bit about ketamine. Um, it is one of the newer psychedelic medicines that's out there. Um, ketamine is the only legal psychedelic medicine that's currently available for use with a prescription. It has, <clears throat> excuse me, a robust safety profile. So it was first synthesized in 1962 and it was FDA approved in 1970. Um, it is used in adults and in children and vet medicine. It's deemed an essential medicine by the World Health Organization. Uh, one of the reasons it became so popular is because it is a powerful anesthetic, but it does not depress the respiratory system. So many of the other anesthetic agents uh, can cause difficulty breathing. And that's one reason ketamine is often preferred in emergency medicine and anesthesiology, because it doesn't have that effect. Um, but in addition to being an anesthetic, it has many other functions. So it's also an analgesic, so it's good for pain. Um, it is a psycholytic and a psychedelic. So its effect from being mildly sedating to psychedelic to fully anesthetizing is dose dependent. And so ketamine has a really interesting history. So as an antidepressant, we've actually known about its effects since the 1970s. Um, there were physicians and psychologists using it in conjunction with psychotherapy um, as soon as, basically as soon as it became FDA approved. Um, and the first clinical trials looking at ketamine weren't until the late 90s or early 2000s. So in the year 2000, researchers found that ketamine has a rapid onset antidepressant effect, which is starkly different from any of the other antidepressants on the market, which take anywhere from six to eight weeks um, to have an effect if they're going to have an effect. Uh, we know from recent trials that up to 60, 70% of folks don't even respond to first line therapies. Um, so this was a huge breakthrough in psychiatry. 
um, to have for the first time a, a substance that had a proven safety profile that could be used in depression with a rapid onset and could also be used um, in acute suicidality for which you know there's very other, uh, there's little treatment otherwise. So <clears throat> as they started researching ketamine as an antidepressant, they actually found that it had this really rapid onset, but it wasn't always long lasting. So it sometimes in, in some studies, in some cases, it would only last a day or two, sometimes even a few hours, um, but on average around the seven day duration of effect. And so they started doing more studies looking at, okay, well, what if we couple up the therapy? We do twice a week treatments, three times a week treatments, and they noticed that they could extend the life of the antidepressant effect by doing multiple sessions. Um, it's also our belief and our philosophy that combining this medicine as an antidepressant chemical with psychotherapy might be the ticket to extending these effects and making them last longer. Um, and then just to mention really quickly, Spravato. So, so Mark mentioned that there are other models of ketamine therapy. Spravato is one of those. So it is a nasal spray that's FDA approved for treatment resistant depression. And just in in August of 2020, acute suicidal ideation. Um, and it is administered in a medical office setting without any psychotherapy or emotional support. So again, it's a model just to deliver the, the chemical ketamine. And it's quite expensive, I believe six, seven, eight hundred dollars per dose, um, but it is usually covered by insurance. So it could be a good option for your clients who may not be able to afford other ketamine clinics. And then the non-patented version, racemic ketamine, is what we use mainly uh, in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy clinics and infusion clinics. So Mark, what does ketamine do? Okay, let me just plug in my computer and I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> um, so I wanna talk about this from a number of perspectives, both kind of the experiential or phenomenological perspective. So what what does it feel like ketamine does? And then we can go into more of the um, the the neurology for those who are interested or, um, you know, depending on time, maybe I'll, I'll just gloss over that. But if you really wanna get into the, the neurochemistry of it, we can we can do that in the question and answer. Um, but what does, what does ketamine do? So um, maybe I'll start by saying what does ketamine feel like? And um, I just listened to a podcast interview of Phil Wolfson, who's the, as Kayla mentioned, the psychiatrist who trained both of us and kind of one of the pioneers of psychedelic therapy in general in this kind of newish era. Um, and also of ketamine assisted psychotherapy. And so um, I really liked how he said it. He said, you know, one of ketamine's essential function is that it's a timeout from normal mind. A timeout from normal mind. So what does that mean? Well, if your normal is, is you know, having really severe depression, then you get, you get a break from that. Um, and then, so you've had that for five or 10 or 20 years to even have a few hours of this reference of, wow, this is what it feels like to not have this depression or this crushing anxiety or this fear um, is really profound. Uh, I was gonna say, I think what I've actually seen it to be and that that alone can be kind of the, the touchstone for people to move forward with lots of hope and with lots of motivation. Um, and so these things that ketamine does can can elicit that and can create that foundation and can be that kind of that uh, wellspring, if you will, for for the therapy going forward. And so, one of the, some of the things we see it do fairly consistently are it decreases fear response, um, and it does that through how it kind of routes activity in the brain, kind of less activity through the fear centers. Um, for that reason, we can see it increase resilience. So, you know, say someone is having a really difficult emotional response to a certain thing in their life. Often what we see after the ketamine treatment is they're actually more able to tolerate that and their nervous system is more able to stay regulated in the face of that. So that's why we say it increases resilience. Um, the, the ability to see um, for, for insight creation. So we can see different meanings. We can see new meanings for things. Um, a lot of people, are able to reframe 
reframe things that are meaningful in their life. So maybe you're looking at it from a CBT perspective and there's some distortions. Um, it's really easy to kind of re-see and reframe these distortions um, under the ketamine state and after. Those are lasting effects. Um, depressive symptoms, we know it decreases and we'll look at a little bit of research on that. Anxiety symptom it decreases. Um, memory activation. So this is an interesting one. Um, ketamine has a couple a couple effects on the memory. The, the most common one that you'll hear about probably in the medical literature is that it is almost like an amnesic. So for about 24 or so hours after the ketamine experience, they have a fairly good memory of it. But after that, it kind of begins to fade unless you, you know, very consciously put into declarative memory or, or consolidated in some other way, which we'll talk about in the integration. Um, but so, so it can kind of like make things during that time hard to remember if you don't activate that. But what it can also do is can bring up memories from the past. And there's a number of cases that I've seen, and this is consistent with other practitioners, where people will remember things that have happened to them in the past that they either haven't remembered for a long time or in a different way. The memory will be fuller. They'll, they'll have more access to the fullness of the memory. So that's very interesting. I don't know how much that's studied. Um, I'd be very interested to know if any of you do, but it's just something I've seen um, and that's something you know that's seen in general. Um, it can also have, you know, it's not the same as MDMA in terms of being an in, in, in actogen in terms of, oh, there's a very reliable effect of this feeling of closeness and connection and really good for working with attachment and that kind of stuff. But it can be really good for that. It can be excellent actually for, for doing attachment work because there's the opportunity for that closeness and connection. So while we wouldn't expect it every time and every person, um, it's definitely there and it definitely, it definitely comes in something that can be worked with. Um, there's also feelings of joy, uh, feelings of elation, feelings of deep connection to other people, to the world in general. We call that ego dissolution, so less of a sense of separation. Um, and often people will have a sense of purpose under the ketamine experience. Oh, this is the thing that's meaningful for me to do. This is important. This is what I want to start doing in my life. And for me, that's an extremely useful thing to bring into the integration and the therapy. Okay, so I'll just, again, I'll just go over this uh, fairly quickly. I'm just looking at the time. Um, how does it work as an antidepressant? Um, this is, you know, our best... Uh, our best hypothesis so far based on the, the science. You'll often hear about ketamine spoken as an NMDA antagonist, which means it essentially decreases the effect of or the level of activity of the NMDA receptor as triggered by glutamate in the brain. Um, this is kind of true, but what's more true um, based on, on more contemporary research is that it actually changes the routing of the glutamate. So that can have a number of effects. One, like I mentioned earlier, is changing the routing through the fear center. So kind of less activity in the fear center, um, more activity through other association areas. That's why we think, it, you know, enhanced perception of meaning um, and a number of other things. So it has this global neurological activity that kind of just changes how things are routed in the brain, which changes how things are made to mean what they are and which results in changes the meaning of things. And ultimately, that changes, you know, that opens things up to, to starting to create the meanings that, um, that really serve people as, you know, which is a part and parcel of the therapeutic process, right? Um, so that ketamine allows for that opening on a neurological level via these things. And one of the other things it does that you'll hear talked about is this idea of neurogenesis or neuroplasticity or neuronal connection and while each of these are kind of subtly different the effect that they have uh, essentially is that your brain is able to make um, more and new and different connections which again allows for different behavior different different sense of meaning new insights and also creates kind of the pathways for the change in mood Okay, what is the ketamine experience? So I, I spoke to that a little bit. Um, 
You know, it, it really varies, like Halen said, it really varies depending on the dose. And it can be anything from what some people describe as kind of having had half a glass of wine uh, or something to just not being a part of this existence as we know it at all. You know, all of this dissolves essentially or fades away and maybe seems to have never even existed. Um, it's almost a death of sorts, but a death in the way that there never was even any life of this possible and literally being just kind of a single point of consciousness that's connected to everything. So it's along that spectrum. In between there is um, being able to see and experience life in a different way and activate memories and having visions of the future or even come some kind of, you know, what might be called frank psychedelic experiences where people are in this other world, uh, they can still talk to whoever is in the room with them and yet they're experiencing whatever it is, maybe flying through clouds or being in a castle made of crystals or, you know, in, insert, insert vivid imagery here. Um, but people experience those things in a very kind of visceral and vivid and most of the time, very enjoyable way. Um, not all the time, there can be definitely, people have kind of scary or anxious moments in the ketamine space and there can be dark imagery, et cetera, but um, it, can, it can take you anywhere from I'm so in this room and there's nothing else to I'm both in this room and there's another world to I'm completely in this other world to nothing exists uh, except just pure, who knows, who knows what to call it. Um, so that's the phenomenological experience of ketamine. It does just kind of on the on the more grounded in in perception uh, perspective. It you know it it alters your sense of balance. It alters your proprioception, so your feeling within your body. Um, it alters your sensory perception. So, for example, um, hearing becomes very acute, and that's why music is such an important part of it, as you may have heard. So, people can detect really subtle things in hearing. Um, vision becomes less acute, kind of blurry, right? There's there's kind of people will will have difficulty seeing things. We encourage everyone to wear an eye mask um, the entire time to the extent that it's is tolerable. Um, changes in emotion, as we've talked about, can go anywhere from you know, kind of calm, sublime, peacefulness, neutral to elated, joyful, ecstatic, um, as well as an expansion of meaning. People are able to see into their lives and see meanings that either they haven't seen for a while or they maybe have never seen before. Okay, so um, is this, this is me, right? Cool. Um, so ketamine assisted psychotherapy, what is our model? So we kind of here, you can see the subheading, it's a biopsychosocial spiritual approach. Well, what does that mean? Well. It's important for us as a medical setting to attend to the body. So we do extensive screening to make sure that this, you know, molecular entity that's coming into the body is actually a safe thing for that to happen. And as Caitlin mentioned, it is very safe. It's actually remarkably safe compared to pharmaceuticals in general, probably one of the safest ones we have. And yet there are definitely certain, some certain medical considerations to have, um, you know, mostly around uh, cardiovascular issues because ketamine does have the tendency to increase um, increase heart rate, uh, blood pressure, um, cardiac contractility, those kinds of things. Um, you know, and so, um, but there are some other psychological approaches as well. Uh, for example, if people are experiencing, you know, acute or frank psychosis, that's that's probably not the best candidate for a ketamine session. Um, because it already kind of is taking you away from the sense of reality that you're used to. And so if that's not a stable thing, then ketamine is probably not indicated in that case. Um, and then the social spiritual approach, why do we even bother putting that in there? Well, part of, part of our approach is that um, it's important for people to connect to themselves. And we see that as enabling them to connect to others. So we do see this as kind of a socially useful therapy. I mean, I, I think at its foundation, therapy in general is socially useful, right? Um, it's, it's kind of that question of 
of we want to get people out of isolation of their own internal world, whatever obstacles that is that that's keeping them feeling isolated, you know, their symptoms or their physiology or whatever, and to be able to connect with themselves and with others. And the spiritual approach that really relates to um, to that connection with the self, that inner life, right? So apart from any religiosity, it's what's your what is your inner life like? How do you experience it, and how in touch with it are you? So that's what we talk about a biopsychosocial a spiritual approach. Um, in practice, what does that mean? Well, we again we're talking about what we're doing is more than simply administering this drug and seeing symptoms go away. We're actually using the change of state, this change of consciousness as a venue in which to have a, a life change, um, whatever, whatever you want to call it, transformation or progression or relief or whatever it is, something changes in one's life and in one's consciousness in a deep and lasting way. And so in order to facilitate that, um, we make sure that we have a number of things. One of them is beyond that screening process and the medical intake and the psychological intake, we have a preparation. Um, so it's that's ha engaging people in the process of investing into what they want out of this journey. So what is it? What is it that you want? What's your intention? What's your vision for how this will go? Um, how would you like to be supported through this process? What do you need to know in order to feel safe going through this? Because there's a lot of uncertainty, you know? Um, most people have not done ketamine in this setting before. Um, many people have not even had uh, psychedelic experiences before, these kind of very explicit change of states of consciousness. So we want to, in our preparation, it's essential for us to establish safety, to make people feel that um, they're cared for and attended to both on a physiological level and on a psychological level. And then in order to kind of, you know, really help inform that sense of safety and care, um, we're very intentional about our set and setting. So how our clinics look, how they feel, um, the, the music that we use, the affect that we have with our patients, the way that we relate to them. Um, all of these things are in the interest of creating this sense of safety and care. Um, then, so after the preparation session, then we'll have a dosing session with the therapist. And um, that's about two hours. And during that time, the therapist is in the room with the patient the entire time. So they're never alone for that. Um, they And whether they, you know, for some people, they may be talking the entire time. For others, they may not say a word until they're out of that kind of that medicine space um, or that journey space. Either way, there's someone there with them. And we found that doing that really has a profound effect actually and um, and allows them to feel safe in a way that they can kind of explore this internal world and really open up. And then so after that opening from the medicine session, we have our integration. So no matter what happens during that session with the ketamine, um, whether it's transformative or whether it's challenging or whether it's joyful or whether it's scary, uh, that's something we can work with, right? That's why we have our integration sessions where the client comes in and they're working with the therapist and they're unpacking everything that's opened up and they're learning how to use this in their life to make this lasting and positive change. And so um, the experience can vary. It, again, it depends on the dose and part of our expertise. Our expertise is really making sure that we find the right dose for the right person in the right session, right? Because even, because those things can change depending on where they're at and the level of therapy and how each individual responds to it. You know, you'll you'll hear often talked about this idea of a body weight dose. And you know, that's a good rough guide to start with, but what we find in experience is that how people respond to the medicine, whether that's dependent on their metabolism or their nutrition or their psychological predisposition or whatever it is, people respond really different. So we want to make sure to find the right dose for that person on any given day. Um, and then we'll also determine, okay, is this, uh, is this session best served by kind of having a lower dose, more interpersonal, uh, kind of psycholytic where some of their defenses go down 
and they're kind of able to encounter themselves in a new way in relation to our therapist? Um, or is this session really appropriate to have that kind of so-called transformational dose where they really are, have a, a very large change in their state of consciousness uh, where they might have an ego dissolution where they might experience one of these other worlds. And so part of our clinical expertise is determining which one of those is most appropriate for each patient in each session again. Okay, and a little bit on the research. Um, so this is a research study that was done in part of the clinic that I was at along with a number of other clinics. Um, and so 235 patients, as you can see, they received sublingual ketamine. So that's when you kind of take a lozenge and, and absorb it under the tongue or intramuscular, which is what we do in our clinics. And they correlated them to depression and anxiety. So um, just briefly, I mean, this is a great paper. I encourage you to read it, not only for the concrete stats, but it also has kind of some philosophical considerations in the approach. Um, but just to go over these quickly, you can see here that um, when ketamine was used alongside psychotherapy, so the model we believe in, we can see there's you know a significant and pretty robust decrease in these depression scores. This is the back depression inventory too. Uh, this is the ham A for anxiety. Again, same with anxiety. So, so that's it. I mean, it, you, you can read the article and just get a, a, a sense of, of kind of more the intricate nature of the data. But um, it's fairly apparent that there's a, you know, a reasonable effect here. Um, so just research validating the approach of that. Yes, ketamine plus psychotherapy can have these significant improvements. Okay, so... Who, who would this work for, right? Is this good for everyone? Um, that's, that's a big question, not just within our organization, but within the psychedelic world in general. And without kind of going too deep into that conversation, um, I can talk about a few of the populations just initially that must be really beneficial too. So one is depression um, and anxiety. We just kind of showed how you know, there's research on that to really show significant effects for those populations. Um, PTSD, um, again, if we're looking at this through a nervous system perspective, and these are kind of dysregulations of the nervous system, then is it plausible that um, ketamine could help with PTSD? Absolutely. Uh, I've seen it, I've worked with it, and I find it to be really effective. It's a little bit of a different method, depending on how someone is with their PTSD, but um, psychedelics in general are known to really help with trauma-related conditions. Um, ketamine's no exception, um, and so there's definitely a process and approach to work with to work with trauma and how and its manifestations, whether it's PTSD or manifestations of developmental trauma, uh, whatever it is. Um, end of life is something that's been studied more generally in psychedelics. So there's some really good studies about psilocybin with end of life. Um, there's some studies coming out about MDMA and end of life. And we see that when people are able to kind of do this in our work and connect with themselves and have this expanded sense of meaning and lower their fear, which is a tendency of psychedelics, they're really able to come to um, a place of deep insight, even during end of life conditions. And we can see from research with other psychedelics that oftentimes their anxiety about end of life, it's if they have end of life related anxiety, really goes down, aside from all the other benefits that they report, right? Increased connection uh, with their family members and loved ones, increased meaning in their life, less fear about dying, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I have personally worked with people with ketamine at end of life, and I found it to be actually a really beautiful and profound thing to do. So. In general, for psychedelics, yes, and, and for ketamine specifically, um, yes, I really believe it can benefit people at end of life. Um, substance abuse, um, that this is, again, a, a big topic of conversation, right? The obvious comfort controversy, oh, well, should we treat use of one substance with another? Um, and to me, that's that's not that controversial because it really depends on, on what the outcome is, right? And we've seen um, there's a lot of research out there actually to support the benefits of psychedelic therapy in cases of substance use. Um, yeah. We can talk about some others if there's time at the end. I just want to make sure we have time for some questions. Okay, so this is speaking, you know, specifically to, to you as a therapist. So 
say you have someone that you've been working with. Um, is it right for them? If so, when is the right time? If so, what can they expect? So for us, and this comes back to that word breakthrough, and maybe there's a better word, but what it really means for us is, you know, this tendency, if someone's in therapy um, and they've really made good progress, but then they seem to be kind of in a holding pattern or a plateau or something, um, what then? I think there are a lot of good options out there, whether it's, you know, EMDR or somatics or, or whatever it is, you know, um, TMS, whatever it is. Um, I see, I see ketamine assisted psychotherapy as being right up there with the best of those options um, because we've seen people who have kind of gotten to a certain place in their therapeutic process um, and have kind of stayed there for a while be able to get to the next level um, after having done this work. And so to me, the right time is primarily when they have support, right? So if they're like, I don't want to work with you anymore. I want to go do this instead. Um, that would be kind of a moment for me of inquiry. Okay, well, what's that about? But if they're like, you know, there's there's something else that I think I want, or if you feel that there's something else that this person could benefit from, and they do are committed to continuing to work with you, to me, that's the right time and the right fit. Because again, as we're saying, the integration is such an important part of this work for them to have this opening and then have a place to land and continue to work on that with someone they trust and someone they've already made progress. That's huge, right? That will be the most valuable thing for them. And so in terms of what they can expect, I think what they can expect is to have some kind of shift in their consciousness and have some kind of insight. Um, and again, it's so individual. I wouldn't kind of promise more specific things at large, but, um, but I would say they can typically expect some kind of opening, you know, whether that who knows for some people that might be a total relief and they'll say, I'm cured. Um, I still think they should kind of remain in therapy for a bit and do the integration for some people. They'll be like, wow, things are really shaken up. And now I'm like debating leaving this relationship or quitting this job. Again, that's another really important time for them to have support. So it might not, it might not necessarily be settling for them, but, um, it will be opening for them. And it will most likely, as we see over and over again, be really positive. But even if it's not, there is the opportunity to turn it into something positive with the integration and with the ongoing therapy. And that, again, that's why we feel that that you are so such an important role in this because we, we have this limited course of treatment, right? Caitlin will speak more to that. Um, but what happens after that? How to really leverage it and make the most of what happens here? Uh, and that the answer for me is, is you. Yeah, great segue, Mark. Um, so Mark did a great job of, you know, an overview of the process at Field Trip. And um, as we've mentioned, you know, our philosophy is that we combine ketamine with psychotherapy. And in doing that, we engage the patient in their own healing. Um, this is a way that we believe contributes to greater agency in their life and confidence and connection and ultimately better outcomes. And I think what we really want to highlight for you today is that, you know, field trip is a defined course of treatment clinic. So we're a short term or intermittent care facility um, that, and we are hoping that therapists will refer their clients to us uh, to do a round or a program of ketamine assisted psychotherapy. And then we can then refer back to uh, their therapist to help with ongoing integration. So what I want to do is kind of walk you through what the experience in a concrete way is um, at a field trip clinic. So these are actual photos of field trip health in Los Angeles. Our clinic is located in Santa Monica. And this is our team. So we are um, a team of psychiatrists, uh, psychotherapists, and medical professionals. We work collaboratively with each patient. We, our aim is to provide the best care in a safe and nurturing environment for our patients. So a bit about the process. Again, we, we had a bit of an overview, but here you can see it kind of mapped out um, that there's multi-steps to our program. So the first step is a consultation, and then we have preparation, we have treatment with the ketamine, integration, and then the beyond, which is really where you guys come in. So here is a sample protocol um, of what a patient journey might look like. And I, I just wanna highlight that 
every single patient that comes through will have a consultation with a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist will determine if it's both medically and psychologically appropriate for this patient to engage in ketamine therapy. And then he or she will determine um, which which program is best for them. So in, in LA, we have three different tracks depending on the presentation and depending on what we feel like is best for that for that client. And so it really is personalized medicine. We're not doing a, a standardized protocol for every single person walking in the door. We really take into consideration what this patient's goals are, um, what we think ketamine can do for them and, and the best course of treatment uh, for them moving forward. So after that, uh, first psychiatric assessment, if the psychiatrist um, says that they've been approved for treatment, they'll then be assigned a therapist who will do a full psychotherapy intake, and then they will do a preparatory session. So our therapists spend a lot of time with clients before we ever administer the ketamine, uh, getting to know them, preparing them for the experience, helping them get clear on their intentions and their expectations for the treatment and also prepping them on practicalities on what to expect during the program and during their ketamine journey. So after their prep session, they'll have their first ketamine exploration, um, which at that point, the uh, medical team will have cleared the patients, making sure that there's no contraindications medically to receiving ketamine. And then the medical team will administer the ketamine while the therapist remains uh, with them for the duration of their journey, like Mark pointed out. Um, and then actually this graphic is just a bit outdated. We actually have a first integration session after their first ketamine session. So an average protocol might look like six ketamine exploratory sessions and four integration sessions. So for example, they would have a ketamine session followed by an integration, followed by another ketamine session, followed by another integration, et cetera. Um, this process could take between three to six weeks. It depends on the client. So again, we, we try to, have you know practice personalized medicine so it could be a matter of client scheduling and availability that makes it take longer but in some cases it could just be that the therapist and the client together decide that they they need more time they need a slower process to integrate uh, between their exploratory sessions and then after they've completed our program again our hope is that our clients continue their therapy and integration work with outside providers so I just want to show you a couple of pictures of the LA clinic um, and just highlighting that we really do recognize that a large part of the patient experience is the set and setting. So we've made a really conscious effort to create a warm and safe and serene environment. This is our lobby where we welcome patients. And just, you know, to take a moment um, for those who may not be familiar about set and setting, uh, depending on set and setting, the same drug at the same dose can cause vastly different responses in the same person. And that pretty much sums it up. Um, so this concept was developed first in the 1960s. Um, and it's basically the idea that the effects of psychedelic drugs and I would say any psychoactive medication in general or drug in general are dependent on the internal and the external environment in which the experience is taking place. So that is really important to us at all of our field trip clinics that we um, have consciously kind of uh, cultivated this environment. So this is one of our therapy treatment rooms uh, where a patient will have their dosing or exploratory sessions accompanied by their therapist. Um, each clinic is slightly different, but we have anti-gravity chairs for the patient comfort. Uh, they'll have headphones with specially curated music, which is a really important part of the setting, as well as eye shades as part of the experience to encourage them to go inside and have an internal experience. Uh, they'll spend about two hours in this room with their therapist during their exploratory sessions. And after that time, they may be moved into a recovery room um, so that the patient feels like they have time and space to come back into their bodies. We give them tea and snacks and allow them, uh, you know, the space to journal or to draw or to integrate or just relax in any way that they feel comfortable. Um, before they leave the clinic. So this is actually a photo of one of our recovery rooms. And this is a quote from a patient from Los Angeles. Um, he said that I realized in my last session that what I really needed was to sit with my anxiety and make peace with it. I'm always trying to escape my anxiety or fix it. But in my last session, I was able for the first time in my life, I think, to just be with it. Um, and that is 
something you will commonly hear in patients coming out of the ketamine space is that they, they feel they're able to engage with their emotions in a different way and relate to themselves in a different way. And again, a, a, a little bit about outcomes. So Mark mentioned the CAP study by Dr. Dorr et al. Um, and here at Field Trip, we are collecting data as well, where we really value data collection. Um, and we wanna make sure that what we're doing is working and it's helping people. Um, so far, we're seeing great results in our Toronto and New York City clinics. We don't have data yet for LA because um, we've only been open a few months. Um, but what we're seeing so far in the other clinics is an improvement, a significant improvement in depression and anxiety scores, as you can see from moderate to severe before treatment, uh, mild depression and anxiety during treatment and minimal after treatment. And we have noticed that there is a slight increase one month after the program is completed, um, which of course is leading us to think of ways we can keep the benefits going. And one way is to encourage clients to continue their work um, after their program is completed. And Mark, if you wanna talk about integration, please. Sure, I do. Um, that was such a great description of the process. Thank you. Um, I let's see. Um, maybe I'll because I, I know we're scheduled for an hour. I could talk about it, but I also want to make sure that we have room for questions. Um, so, if we have longer, a little longer than an hour, um, I'm good with that. But Alec, I just wanted to check in with you um, and just our viewers in terms of what what the the preferential way to go here is. We can, we can, um, I see a couple of questions and Alec, let me know if I'm missing some, but I think we can answer a couple of these and then Mark, you can talk a little bit more as questions come in. Okay, great. Because I think it's, it's important to talk about the importance of integration. Um, so one is, um, are clients who are in other MAT services, methadone, uh, et cetera, uh, appropriate? Yes, yeah, great question, right? And this kind of is that intersection about the um, with the substance with the substance use question. Um, you know, it's hard to answer that one across the board, uh, as I'm sure you guessed, because um, it really depends on the stability and the use and the course of that that treatment and where they are in the program. Um, but I will say this about it: um, just a clinical consideration. Ketamine actually it does not interact with too many other medications, but some of the medications it does interact with are um, opiates and benzodiazepines in the sense that those are thought to maybe attenuate or just lessen a little bit the effects of ketamine. So, um, you know, there are pe some people who will really take, take those clients on, even if they're working on those and even see ketamine as a really appropriate intervention to, to facilitate that um, whereas others want their clients to be totally off of the, the methadone, the buprenorphine before initiating the ketamine experience. So again, that's, that's kind of a conversation with the medical side and the psychiatrist and depends on the patient. Um, so I know that's not kind of a very uh, decisive answer, um, but what I will say is that um, it's, it's not, ideal and it's not impossible. Okay, great, thank you. Um, why don't you go ahead, Mark, with the integration? Okay. Okay, so um, the importance of integration. I don't think we need to spend too long on this because we've already kind of been speaking to it throughout, but um, just to reiterate a little bit, do we have the next slide, by the way? On this mm -hmm. one? Just to, oh, okay, we can go back to the importance of integration. Good. So, so just to say what's already been said, which is that this um, is a process. Um, and again, this is why we talk about the breakthrough, right? There's something that's closed or something that's in the way, an obstacle. And we kind of see this process, what we do as helping to open things up, as helping to remove the obstacle. And so the question is, okay, great. Well, what then? And that's, where the importance of integration comes in. So we start that integration process at the clinics just in terms of a per experience basis, a per journey basis. So you've come out of your ketamine session, things have opened up. How does that come in for a landing? How do you ground that? How do you make sure that's usable and workable and beneficial? 
Um, and so we do that within the course of this treatment. And then afterwards, still things are still open. Things are still coming in for a landing. That obstacle is still removed. So how do you make sure that it kind of stays removed and fill that space with the intentions that the patient has for themselves and for your therapeutic intent for the patient? Um, and so it's really kind of a launching point. And so the importance of integration is to keep that trajectory going in that, that beneficial direction. And so ideally that's something that you will have started with your clients in your work even before, even just if you're considering this, when you're considering this, you will have started talking about, okay, what is it that you really want out of this? How could this help you? What would you do with an opening? And then so the opening occurs and then after the field trip course and treatment, they come to you and they say, okay, how can we maintain this openness? What do we want to do with it? Um, where do we want to go from here? And so we have already kind of started that process at the clinic. And so the client will really be able to come with to you with, you know, this is what I want. This is where I want to go. This is the work that I want to continue. And then you will be able to continue that work. So the, the effects of the integration are that whatever benefit they receive from the treatment really gets to exist and persist and evolve. Um, and the importance of it is that without the integration, sometimes that, you know, some, listen, some, some people do fine on their own after that, but we just want to really make sure that they have the opportunity for these, bene for these benefits to persist. And that's the importance of the integration. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to add that brought something up for me that I want to point out, which is that, you know, this is a hugely popular field at the moment. And there are a lot of people who, um, you know, maybe were raised in the era of thinking that, you know, if I take LSD, I'm going to go crazy and I'm never going to come back from my trip, um, who are now actually considering these medicines as healing um, as agents of healing. And so as we expand um, more and more people wanting to try this, you know, it's really important to find reputable places um, and safe places where your clients can go. Because I, I know that they're out there talking to you about, well, I would really like to try this, but I don't know what to do and I don't know where to go. Um, and so I think that it's probably important for a lot of therapists to know that when they send someone to, you know, our clinics, that they're getting excellent medical care, they're getting ex excellent psychological care, um, and they're not gonna be kind of left after their ceremony or session um, kind of out in the dust, like we, we're gonna take care of them. So uh, that's kind of a tangent, but, but it just came up, Mark, as you were talking, that um, the importance of making sure that, you know, it's really valuable, that this type of work, but to make sure that we're doing it in a safe way. Exactly. Um, very well said. Yeah, so let's see. Okay, so, you know, this is, we just wanted to talk about this a little bit um, just because it is possible. We really want to involve and kind of immerse in the community of therapy that's already occurring, right? We're, as, as Caitlin said, we're just kind of this, this stop along the way. And so how can um, we integrate with what you're doing and how can you integrate with what we're doing? And so one of the conversations and, and plans is that, um, you know, how, how can the patients and the clients be better served? Well, if um, you are interested in this process and are kind of more in and, and very aware about what the preparation and the integration for that requires. And so we um, will be offering to therapists ways to engage in learning about, well, how, how do we do this and how can you do this? And how can you learn the skills specifically for psychedelic therapy preparation and integration so that um, you will be able to best help your clients. And additionally, so that we'll know that if clients come through us that don't seem to have a place to land, maybe they've never been in therapy before, maybe they don't currently have a therapist, we'll know, oh, we know exactly where we can send you and we trust how they work because we train them. So we know exactly how they work. And so that's something that we're really excited for and we're really looking um, to, to you as the therapist community for is to be a place where people can go after they've come to see us. And so we're um, creating programs 
to be able to make that happen. Great. And um, if you are interested in, in sending your clients here, um, we got permission to give um, a coupon code for this webinar. So there will be a discount um, for for the uh, the course of treatment. Um, and you know, please, if you're interested, you know, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Obviously, um, and then we have this this coupon code for you to use is FT Web Twelve and. Um, that way we'll know you saw this webinar and you can get this discount and then your clients will be able to um, to, to benefit from that. Or, you know, if you feel this could, could be beneficial for for yourself, um, obviously you're welcome to, to come see us as well. We, in, we invite you to. And, um, you know, for a lot of people they are interested in that because it gives them an understanding of what the experience is. And, and I think for a lot of practitioners, they actually really want to know what it is that they're recommending their clients. So um, that has kind of been a, a very um, appreciated and effective thing for, for practitioners to do is have the experience themselves and then um, they really feel qualified to, to speak about it to their clients. Absolutely. All right, guys, okay. that's that's all we have. We, we have a question. Um, about patients using cannabis, can ketamine-assisted psychotherapy be used in patients who use cannabis? If so, how long do they need to abstain prior to CAP? Um, great question. Again, there are a number of, of different opinions on this, um, ranging from, you know, it's best to avoid cannabis for some time before, maybe a week or, or maybe a few days before, just so they can kind of experience that ketamine experience in a pure way. Well, there are others, including, you know, our teacher, Phil Wolfson, who feels that actually they go really well together and really believes in the therapeutic potential of cannabis um, and thinks that those medicines actually complement each other quite well. And so to me, the question is, um, I, I would put it back to you in terms of how are they using the cannabis, right? Is it is it very healing? Is it medicinal for them? Are they using it intentionally? Is it an escape? Are they addicted? Are they dependent? Um, so for me, I would, those are the, it's not kind of a, a make or break issue, but if someone came to me and said, I'm using cannabis, what, what should I do with respect to this treatment? Um, I would really want to understand how they're using it, why they're using it, um, if it could be beneficial for them to take a break from it, or if it would actually really complement the ketamine assisted therapy. Yeah. Um, a lot of these questions are, it depends, right? Um, that's the answer. Um, and I just want to offer to um, everyone to reach out to us. You know, we're available to have these conversations. These are the conversations we want to be having. This is what we're passionate about. If you have questions about whether or not you think your client may benefit from this or may be appropriate for this, um, you can email us, you can contact me. I'm in Santa Monica if you're local. Um, come by for a tour once COVID settles down. And we really want to be a part of the broader community. So, you know, when we talked earlier about, you know, biopsychosocial model, we really think that the social aspect is missing for a lot of folks that could use ketamine therapy, right? So depression is often described as a very isolating condition. Um, and we think that having a community is, is really important and healing in itself. So we're really hoping to open up field trip, um, to the community, to, you know, host events at some point to do integrative circles for our, um, for our clients who have already been through to come back and be able to talk about their experiences with other people. Um, so please feel free to reach out if you have any questions at all, we're here to help. And I think that's, oh, um, do you have a timeline for the new Chicago location? Um, Alec, are you, <laughs> Alec may have the answer to that. Okay, Alec said, our Chicago clinic is currently facilitating virtual appointments and we'll be taking in-center appointments in the coming weeks. Great. So great answer, thank you. I saw another question, which was about uh, sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure specifically what what you're asking um, with that question, Judy. If you, if you want to pop it in the chat, um, you can. But just to to mention, um, 
you know, sleep apnea, I think, is really important to be screening for in your patients, especially when it comes to depression, right? Because hypoxia or low oxygen levels can really be a big contributor to that, if not one of the main causes. So um, I am a big proponent of people who have sleep apnea getting treated for it in some night, whether you're taking the anti-inflammatory approach or the surgery approach, whatever whatever you feel like is best. I mean, I have my opinions on that, but, um, but that they seek treatment for that. Um, you know, ketamine is an anti-inflammatory, so plausibly it can, it can relieve some of the symptoms temporarily of sleep apnea, but it, it, I wouldn't say it, it cures it. Um, and there are even cases in which uh, I've, I've kind of discovered someone has a potential for sleep apnea um, in a ketamine session because we, we take their, their vitals. So afterwards, you know, they seem to kind of be sleeping and they're snoring a lot. And then afterwards they put the pulse ox on and they had not a, an emergent pulse ox, but lower than I would have expected. And so that led to the inquiry of like, well, how are you sleeping and et cetera, et cetera. And um, then referred out for a sleep study. So um, this is, you know, again, I don't know what, what your specific question is with the relation to patients with sleep apnea and ketamine. But um, just as a general thing, I think it is important to have patients worked up for sleep apnea if it's a consideration um, and then to, have to be treated for it, especially if there's kind of severe, severe unremitted depression. Yeah, we, we do. I mean, sleep apnea can certainly be a cause of, of daytime fatigue and all sorts of um, which, you know, can be uh, diagnosed wrongly sometimes as depression or a mental health condition. Uh, we do screen for sleep apnea. So I'm wondering if she's worrying, is wondering if uh, there's, that's a contraindication to ketamine. Um, again, ketamine has a really uh, safe profile with the respiratory system, but we do screen for severe sleep apnea. And like Mark said, you know, we're a holistic clinic. So if we find that someone um, has sleep apnea, we are going to encourage them to get that taken care of since it can affect so many pieces of one's life. Um, but a mild case of sleep apnea is not going to preclude someone from getting ketamine treatment. Totally. And, that, and then I see, so I see the second part of your question, which I'll answer in a second, but I, it's actually, that can be, you know, a good part of the clinical thinking. If someone goes through this course of treatment and they seem to be improving, but they don't last and not, no treatments have really lasted. Uh, and why not? This, it's kind of confusing, right? Well, there could be some other obstacle there, but there could be some underlying physiological cause. So if you have someone who's gone through ketamine therapy and they seem to be better for a while, but then now they're really depressed and tired again, definitely consider something like sleep apnea, some other underlying phys physiological cause there. and Encourage them to get that worked up from a medical professional. Um, I see the second part of your question was, I was wondering about increased risk of respiratory depression. It's a really good qu question. As Caitlin had mentioned earlier, um, ketamine, one of the reasons why it was so made such a big impact is because it doesn't have those same risks of respiratory depression as some of the other um, anesthetics like opiates, right? Like morphine can do that. There's the risk of that, uh, et cetera, fentanyl. Um, ketamine is actually in thought to increase respiratory drive. And it's one of the reasons why they use it um, in emergency situations. You know, they're starting to use it more and more in motor vehicle accidents because it maintains, you know, if someone goes into shock, it does maintain a stable blood pressure as well as a stable respiratory drive. So uh, if anything, I would say it's actually has the potential to be stabilizing in, in respiratory conditions. You know, we don't, again, we don't want to push it and, and cardiovascular and respiratory conditions are something we're very conscious of and we're always looking out for. But um, if the person was, had sleep apnea and was otherwise stable and healthy, I wouldn't be worried about that. Yeah, neither would I. Great. Um, well, thank you, everyone. I think that that about wraps it up for us. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. And again, if you have any questions, any any follow up um, comments, please reach out. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. And Alec put in the in the chat.